Thank you very much. I am honored by that hand clap. I really am. <clears throat> and I'm going to bring it, Nick. Amen. Wow, what an incredible service. Uh, we could go home right now and just feel like we'd been with the Lord. But I think there's a little more that God wants to do. And I know you sense that too. I'm just thrilled to be here. I love Pastor Rick so much. Uh, man, he was just a great friend while I was here in Pittsburgh and uh, has continued to be a great friend after the fact. And I appreciate him so very much. Why don't we give another gift a big hand? Let's give Pastor Rick a big hand. Can we do that? fans. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow, that's great. Uh, I just feel like, uh, I feel like I'm connected uniquely to Pittsburgh in that I lived here for 12 years, had two of three, two of my three children here, and really my third one grew up here from the age of five uh, to 17. So uh, I just have such a, a, a heart for Pittsburgh, and it's just so cool to be here tonight, and be with you guys, and uh, I was very honored that Pastor Rick asked me to come, uh, surprised that he asked me to come, and honored that he asked me to come, um, and I just, uh, man, I, you guys make me feel so welcome. Uh, I just got to give it up for these musicians and singers. Didn't they do a great job tonight? Amen. So good. So good. You know what? I just got to say the scripture people, they have done a great job too, being on it with all the scriptures back there. Amen. I don't know if y'all have ever been called the scripture people before or not, but that's what I'm calling you. Great job. Uh, all the, the parking lot guys, man, you guys are awesome. They were here this morning early. Appreciate you. And now they've recognized my little rental car. And when I come in, they're just like, reserved over here. So it just, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a church. Uh, you just can't do this on your own. You need help. And I just think it's so neat that this is a conference, but it's a conference for the church. And it's, it's just, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of cutting edge in a way, really. It's a gathering together of church members. We don't have a lot of out-of-towners. We don't have a lot of people traveling from all over the place in a big conference environment. But you guys are showing your hunger for the kingdom of God by being here all weekend long, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and tomorrow. I know you're going to be there strong tomorrow morning. So uh, this is just, man, I'm, I'm just enriched by this and thrilled by this. I do want to make a couple more quick remarks. I want to say it's great to have David and Ginger Coleman from Oklahoma City here. We welcome them. Man, I've never had groupies before, ever, but I have groupies this weekend. Man, it feels good. And I also want to make mention of uh, Nate and Danielle Richter I see back there. Is that Sharon back there? Sharon Mickens, wow. They're from Grace Point across town. I'm glad they came tonight. Man, I've got five groupies here tonight. Wow, this is awesome. I feel good. I'm ready to roll. Um, how many loves Jesus? Do you love Jesus? He's the best thing that's ever happened to me, and I just, I, I can't live without him. And man, I just felt such grace and peace and just so many emotions a few minutes ago as we rested in the presence of God. I'm one of the worst violators of the no silence, uh, of the, the silence rule, however you say that. I don't know if that's a double negative or not, but I hate silence. I hate being quiet. I'm always going. I'm always doing something. And that moment, I was so tired, but that moment, I just woke up and I was like, whoa, I don't know if I had a spiritual nap or what, but I felt so filled with energy after that moment. And uh, I just, I love Jesus so much. Can, can you imagine what it would be like to be Jesus' 12 disciples, to be 
the guys that walked with this incredible man for three years, walked with him, talked with him. Uh, man, they prayed with him. They saw him minister to people. They, they rode on across lakes and storms and boats with him. They watched him care for children. They watched him heal the withered hands, and they saw him uh, command blinded eyes to be open. Can you imagine what it would be like to spend three years with that person? Now, I used to really get excited about my Tuesday, once a month Tuesday meals with Pastor Rick, and I loved to come over here and talk with him and spend a little time with him, and every now and then he'd give me an extra day, like, you know, a Friday night or something, and I love that. He's a great guy, but he's not Jesus. I mean, I was thinking about how much I was looking forward to this weekend, and I wanted to spend time with Pastor Rick, and I wanted to be here with, with you guys and all that, but as great as Pastor Rick is, he's not Jesus. I mean, I don't know about you, but one of my grandest desires in life is to see Jesus Christ face to face. I want to see Jesus. I mean, I have talked about Jesus my whole life. I've, I've sang from, as they say, knee high to a grasshopper. I've been in Oklahoma, guys. <laughs> knee high to a grasshopper. I sang about Jesus. Jesus loves me, this I know. You guys know that. And then I got a little older, and it was like, Jesus loves me, this I know. And then I got old like I am now, and I'm like, Jesus loves me, this I know. It's just, it's all been about Jesus. My whole life, it's been Jesus this and Jesus that. And man, when I go play golf and I'm playing with guys, I never tell them, uh, I never tell them what my profession is. I just get with the groups and start playing. And it, it just, it's like, a, it's like a dagger to the heart when they miss a shot and they misuse the name of Jesus. In fact, one time I told one of those guys, I looked at him and said, man, it is not his fault. <laughs> if he were here, he'd do a miracle and you'd hit a straight shot. <laughs> I told him that. Come on, it was one of those days when I'd prayed that morning. I was feeling bold. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all about Jesus. And just, I don't know what I would give. I would empty out my wallet. I would, I would empty out my IRA. I would empty out everything just for one glimpse into his eyes. I would. I don't, I don't know about you guys. Tithing? That's nothing. I'll tell you, I would give anything just to see Jesus. And in my mind, the greatest, the culmination of all things, the greatest moment of all moments is going to be when I hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Is that what you want to see? Is that what you want to hear? So I just want you to travel with me for a few minutes back in time, 2,000 years ago, to a time when Jesus was walking on the earth. And get pretend that you're Peter or pretend that you're James or John or one of the disciples, Matthew. Just, just pretend that you're one of the disciples and, and think about how you've been drinking it in and how bold your faith is and how powerful you feel. And, and you're just like, you are so pumped about your leader. You're one of the chosen 12. You are one of the chosen select group that gets to spend all day, all night, walking and talking with Jesus. When you go into this, this crowd scenario and people are flocking, you're the guy standing up there with security written across their t-shirt. Back up. Jesus needs his space. You are the inner circle of the almighty God incarnate Jesus Christ. Man, yeah, you guys are getting it. You're like seeing it now. You're like, wow, yeah, I'm, I feel like Peter right now. 
You've seen everything. It's, it's just been amazing. And in your mind, you're looking around, and you're seeing the Roman rulers, right? And you're seeing uh, all of these guys that are so filled with themselves. You know how politicians are. They're just so like, oh, we've got this. We've, we've got it all under control. Come to me, minions, and I will instruct you on how to live, right? Because their lives are so together, and you're looking at them, you're walking in the streets, and you're like, you guys don't get it. You don't know what he's getting ready to do. You don't understand that he's about to ascend to a throne. You don't understand Isaiah 9 and 6 that I quoted this morning. They were like, this is the guy. John the Baptist declared, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. You guys don't get it yet. You don't understand it yet. But this is the true king. And before long, we're going to be the guys looking at the minions, the ones who are on the select throne, uh, gathering around the throne, worshiping Jesus. We're going to rule this land. Now, maybe they didn't have as bad an attitude as I do right now, but maybe just for a minute, they thought we're going to be in charge. And all of these dreams are building up in their head. Maybe they thought about where they would live and where Jesus' palace would be and all these things going through their brain. And then one day, Jesus sets them down. He looks them in the eyes and he says, guys, he said, I've got some news for you. I know that this has been incredible the last three years and you've seen some amazing things and, and you guys have sold your fishing business. You've sold out. You're, you're no longer a tax collector. You're not a physician anymore. You have given up everything just for me. And I appreciate that. And, and that's the right thing. And you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what you should have done. But guys, here's the deal. Uh, I'm going away. And, uh, you know, we, I, I've got a path that I need to walk that uh, it's, it's going to be a tough road. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a pretty extreme scenario and, and you're not going to see me anymore. And then, and then Thomas raises his hand up and says, oh, wait a minute, or, or Philip or somebody in John 14, you guys look it up and, and tell me who it was. He says, hey, hey, Jesus, show us the way. And we'll go with you. Show us where you're going and we, we, we'll, we'll tag along. It's okay. If you want to leave this area, that's fine. We will go with you. And then Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You, you guys don't quite get what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is, is that I literally am going away and I'm going to leave you here. Whew. What? Wait, wait just a minute, Lord. Uh, the, look, you've got, everything is in place. All the pieces have fallen into place. Everything is connected. Now is the time to ascend to the throne. Now is the time to take control. Now is the time to lead this people. And then Jesus is like, no, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. You, you don't understand. I have to go away. Here's, here's the deal, guys. If, if, you just would, if you just listen for a minute, if you just get an insight for a moment, I'm going away. But it's actually a good thing that I'm leaving. It's a good thing. Wait a minute, wait, no, no, there's no way, Lord. There's no possible, this cannot be a good thing. There's no way. I don't want to go back to the way it was. I don't want to go back to fishing. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back to being a nobody. I am now with you. I'm connected to the Messiah. We believe you're the Messiah. How can this be? And Jesus just looked back at them with great, uh, great compassion, but yet firmness of speech. And he says, I'm sorry, guys. This is the truth. John 16 and 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Whoa, wait a minute, Jesus. Wait, let me, let me get this straight. You're saying that you're leaving, but yet you're going to send something or someone or what is, I'm going away. And wait a minute, you're saying this is to my advantage? It's expedient for you 
that's advantageous. That is good for you. That's, it's actually, it means better. Your situation is going to improve if I go away. Now, I'm with the disciples. Even as I'm speaking right now, I'm still having trouble wrapping my brain around this. How can it be better that Jesus is not here? How can it be expedient? How can it be advantageous? How can it, how can it be of benefit to me that Jesus is not here right now? And then Jesus says, you guys just have to understand. I, I, I'm going away, but, but I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to send a helper. I'm going to send an advocate. I'm going to send somebody that is going to be with you all the time. And here's the deal, guys. You don't, you don't quite get it now, but right now I can be only in one place at one time. I can only affect one group of people. Maybe we can draw 10,000 on a lazy Saturday and we'll feed them five loaves and fishes and, and, and we'll turn it and multiply it and we'll work a miracle. That's great that we're reaching 10,000 people. But here's the deal, guys. If I go away and the comforter comes to you, I'm going to be able to multiply myself many times over in thousands and thousands of and thousands of people and literally whether I'm there in body or not I will be there in spirit all over the world Oh, the light bulb, the wheels start to turn and they're starting to think, oh, wait a minute here. What, what is this? What is this that Jesus is speaking of? And, and then their minds travel back a couple of chapters where Jesus begins to speak to them in John chapter 14 and verse 12. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works shall he do, because I go to the Father. And then they're, they're, they're kind of thinking and, and processing, and, and then they're, they're thinking back to John 14 and 18, and Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You won't be left as an orphan. I know this is intimidating. I know that this is tough to wrap your brain around, but hear me, I'm not gonna leave you as an orphan. I'm gonna come back to you. Look at verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Oh, wait a minute, Lord. So you're going away, but I'm still going to have a teacher. So, wait, let me get this straight. You're not going to be sitting there on, on the hillside somewhere just kind of kind of kicked back in your gentle tone and just kind of, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after. Oh, so you're not going to be doing that. But that which you're sending to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every moment, not just in an isolated moment on a hillside, but literally every moment of every day, there's going to be a teacher there. The spirit of truth is going to be speaking into my mind and into my heart and telling me things and, and explaining things to me. And when I have questions, I don't have to wait to get your attention two or three days later when I can catch up with you. But literally in that moment, you can speak to me. Oh, I'm, I'm starting to see the picture here now, Lord. I, I'm starting to get it now. So this comforter, this helper, what does that mean? He's going to be an advocate. He's going to be on my side. I, I've, I've, got a, I've got a manager in our church back in Oklahoma City, and uh, he, he was telling me just the other day, he said to me, he said, you know, the problem in this world right now is you just can't get no good help. Anybody ever felt that way? It's like, I'd like to hire a gardener, but you just can't get no good help. My English has improved since I moved to Oklahoma. Man, I'd like to hire an electrician, but just can't get no help. You know what I'm saying? Jesus said, listen right now, here's the deal. He's gonna be your comforter, your helper, your advocate. He is good help. 
You see, guys, sometimes you have to go home to your wives and your kids, and sometimes uh, you have to take a business trip across the lake uh, to the other side, and sometimes uh, people need your attention in Bethlehem, and, and I'm back here in Jerusalem, but here's the deal. You will never have to go on a business trip again by yourself without me and wish I was there to help you. I'm going to be there with you. Amen. And, and the wheels are starting to turn and they're starting to get this. And they're like, wow, so the comfort of the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Christ. And then Jesus takes it a step further. He says, but I'll send another comforter. Now, uh, the way we read that, it sounds like maybe it's something a little bit different. But there's two tenses of that word another in the Greek, and one means the way we think of it as, oh, it's a separate entity, it's something completely different. But the other tense of the Greek literally means the same as. And wouldn't you know, the one that Jesus used was the word another that means the same as. That's why we say we have the spirit of Christ within us because the Holy Spirit speaks the language of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit understands the mind of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is given to us. We are baptized by Christ. You see, John baptized with water, but there's one that came after him that baptized with the Holy Ghost. And so if we are filled with the Holy Ghost, if we have the Holy Ghost inside of us, it's the Spirit of Christ residing within us, teaching us truth, leading us in the right way, empowering us to live an overcoming life. It's a pretty cool deal. Some of you are starting to get concerned. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. I would think the opposite. <laughs> You're going away. My life's going to become a living hell, right? <laughs> You're leaving, Lord. These guys with big rocks that we're not afraid of right now. If you're not here, we're getting a little scared. <laughs> Where you at, Lord? Man, my, I'm butchering the king's English. Where you at, Lord? It's not proper English, by the way where are you would probably be more appropriate. But where you at, God? Come on, where you been? We're from the hood, and we need you to be there with us. I can't even do a good hood accent. Yeah. <laughs> he says, look, guys, my peace, I'm going to leave with you. I'm not taking peace away. I'm going to leave it with you. By the way, I'm the one that stood out there that day. You guys remember we were out on the boat and the storm was crazy and all kinds of junk was happening. And I just said, peace, be still. And you stepped back and said, wow, who is this guy? Even the winds and the wave obey his commands. My peace, I'm leaving with you. And here's, here's, here's the crazy scripture. This one still just gets a hold of me. It's hard for me to understand I can't quite fathom it. I read it earlier, but I'm going to read it again. 14 and 12 of John. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Now, guys, that goes against everything I've ever been taught as a Christian. I've been told my whole life that he must increase and I must decrease, right? I've been told my whole life that I've got to bow and surrender before God. And I've been told that pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Oh, I can see my dad preaching right now with his vein popped right out of this. Pride comes before destruction, son. And that was just in our living room. You should have seen him when he got in the pulpit. You guys think I scream. Oh, man, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, I'm just told my whole life that my ego, my pride, my, my you know, it's, I've got to suppress all that stuff. And Jesus is the greatest, and I am the scum of the planet. Right? Okay, maybe that's just the way I was raised. I don't know. You guys, thank God you weren't raised like that. Man, I was awful. I could never do good things. I was never good enough. It was never right. <laughs> Didn't matter how right I was, I was still wrong. Two rights don't make a right. Two rights make a wrong, apparently. 
you know? And then I read this scripture and it says, greater works than these shall I do. That's wrong on so many levels. What are you talking about, Jesus? There's no way. First of all, what could I do that's greater than Jesus, right? What could I possibly do that's greater than Jesus? I've never, I've preached at a lot of funerals. I've officiated a lot of funerals, but I've never looked at the casket and said, rise up and walk, and boom, they got up out of the casket. Only Ray Stevens does that. Okay, you don't get that. I ain't sitting up with the dead no more since the dead started sitting up too. No, nobody. Nobody. Uh, all right. That wasn't Oklahoma. That was Louisiana. I'm, I've been a lot of places. <laughs> no, I've, n- I've never seen a man come out of a tomb wrapped up in clothes and throw him off and told him he stinks. And I- I've never done that. I have never, ever walked, <laughs> looked out over the sea and seen Jesus walk. I, I've never stepped out of the boat. At least Peter stepped out of the boat. He didn't stay up too long, but he did step. I've never even done that. But this word is greater works than he did you're going to do. So that leaves us with a problem. First of all, you just can't get any greater than the works that Jesus did. There's no way. I mean, the miracles pretty much covered the gamut. There's no way to get greater than the things that Jesus Christ did. So we have to realize, first of all, that that is a little misleading. It's not greater in terms of it's better. It's greater in terms of proportion. Okay? Jesus, in his miracle ministry in Scripture, I should have counted them up, but I'm just not thorough like that. So I don't know how many miracles he did. But I think it's around 50, okay? Anybody ever counted up how many miracles Jesus did? No. All right. I think it was around 50-ish. Ballpark, okay? Here's the deal. He was limited in the amount of things that he could do because he was confined to a body, right? He was confined to one place at one time, and he before his glorification, he didn't just pop in through walls and show up in different places. It was a little bit different. He could only be in one place at one time. But the beauty of what Jesus was telling them is, is I am going to send the promise of the Father to you. And so now everywhere that anybody is that has the promise of the Father, they can walk around with the same authority, with the same power, with the same might, with the same miracle ministries that I did when I was here. And so now think about the day of Pentecost that started with 120 and then became 3,000 in one day. Man, oh man, oh man. We work for... We work for lifetimes to get 300 people to come to church, right? And one day they built a mega church from 12 to 3,000 in one day. And now imagine how those 3,000 begin to spread out around the countryside with the message of the gospel and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And they begin to minister everywhere they went. And suddenly the 50 or 60 or 70 miracles that Jesus did in his in his limited Uh, ability in one place at one time. Now, literally all over the countryside, there are folks filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit that are laying hands on people and seeing miracles and seeing signs and and witnessing to foreign nations and, and seeing all kinds of things happen in one moment. They're all over the place and it comes to mind greater in proportion so what Jesus could only do in one body in one moment in one place he now has spread the the little the little uh, disciples all over the countryside and everywhere they go they are now filled with power amen Oh, this is, this is so good. This, all of this stuff is just, it's, it's starting to get in my head. All, I'm starting to realize, wow, man, just think about it. Think about how powerful this is that all these people are now filled with Jesus Christ. And now all these people are taking authority and power and might all over. So they get it. They get it. Okay, I've got to hurry. I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. But they, they, they start to get it. Little light bulbs come on, and they're like, okay, we're ready, Lord. And then he calls them up on the mountainside, and he says, hey, I want you to go into all the world. I want you to preach the gospel to every creature. 
I want you to spread it all over the place. I want you to, I want you to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I want the blinded eyes to be open. I want you guys to spread the good news all over the land. Go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Rebuke the spirits. Do it all. And then he says, but wait a minute. Hmm. Now, folks, okay, we've, we've traveled this journey from I'm with Jesus, I'm in mourning because Jesus is leaving, and now I've seen Jesus die, and I've seen him rise again, and now I'm standing up there, and he's telling me to go into all the world, and I can't wait to get out there. You see, in this moment when the Great Commission is issued, they believe in Jesus Christ like they have never believed in Jesus Christ. I mean, they believed in him back then when he was healing the sick and raising the dead and all this stuff. But when you see a dude go to a cross, expire, breathe his last breath, go into a grave, huge stone rolled up there, and then you see him bust out of that, and for 40 days he walks around and he talks to you and he teaches you and he loves on you and he shares with you kingdom secrets, that's when you really believe in Jesus. Amen? Starting to feel like an Easter Sunday message around here. Man, I'm telling you, they are just like, they are frothing at the mouth. They are so gung-ho. They're like, you know, those horses at the Kentucky Derby, right? They're just, they're in that cage and they can't wait for the bell to sound. They just want to get out and the bell sounds and boom, they hit the track. That's the way these disciples were. They're just like, yes, you rose from the dead. You're king of kings. We get it now. Just let us go. Let us get out of here. Let's take the world by storm. And then Jesus says to them in Acts chapter 1, in verse four, let's see if we can call it up on the screen because I can't find it in my notes. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to hurry up and wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. You remember, guys, all the stuff I was talking about? You remember that, Peter? You remember that, John? You remember that, James? Hey, listen, you've heard that from me. And now, verse 5, he says, wait. He said, I want you to go to Jerusalem. Look at what verse 5 says. For John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, let's just, let's just read through this a little bit. So when they come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do it now. Look at verse 7. He says, uh, the, the times, uh, the seasons, it's, it's not for you to know. And then here's the kicker, verse 8. He says, if you guys will hurry up and wait, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I know you're ready to go, guys. I know that you believe. I know that you're, you're just frothing at the mouth. But listen, guys, there is something I've been telling you about. I told you back in John 14. I told you back in John 16. If you would just wait a few more days, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come on you. And you're going to go out and do things that are greater than anything the world has ever seen before. Whew. I don't know about you, but if I'd traveled that journey with Jesus, I'd be, all right, Lord, I don't want to do it. It doesn't sound good. I just want to go tell everyone about you and about your blessings and about your power. But all right, I'm going to wait because I want to receive power. The King James Version says, until you be endued with power. You know what that word endued means? It means clothed. You know, my son, he's nine years old. Uh, he's going through a stage right now where he uh, doesn't like to wear a shirt. I don't get it. Here's the thing. You've seen scrawny nine-year-olds before, right? You haven't seen scrawny. He's not here, so I'll talk about him. Don't anybody call Oklahoma and tell him, all right? You haven't seen scrawny until you've seen my son. His arms are about as big around as that finger right there. But he walks around, he walks around the house, he gets in the mirror, he's like, man, he's just like, Rawr. he looks at he's like, look, dad, look at my muscles. I'm like, yeah, okay, bro. <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, he comes to the dinner table with no shirt on. Is this normal? Anybody that's had 
This is my first son. I don't know. Is this normal, guys? I don't know. He comes to the dinner table. We're like, Nathaniel, you can't eat dinner without a shirt on. He doesn't want to wear a shirt. I, I, we send him back to his room, and finally he gets clothed. Because uh, you guys be glad that I've come out of that stage, all right? <laughs> this is not a pretty sight up here. I've had one too many Krispy Kremes right here. <laughs> But when you're clothed with something, it means that you're covered with something. It means that, that you don't see all this stuff underneath. You don't see the weak little string bean arms underneath, okay? You guys don't see this flab that's right here right now. I know how to dress, all right? I, I know how to get the right shirts where you, you guys are like, he, he doesn't look flabby. Trust me, it's under there, all right? Look at that right there. <laughs> that was bad. If my wife was here, I'd be I'd be done right now. She sent me home. Be like, <laughs> yeah. No tweets, please. No Facebook. Nothing. What happens in Pittsburgh stays in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Until you be clothed, you cover up all of your flaws. You guys don't see all the weird hairs I have growing out in opposite directions right here. All right, you guys don't see that. Man, I'm just digging deeper. You give a guy a shovel, he just, he just keeps going. You guys shouldn't laugh. If you wouldn't laugh, I'd shut up, but you keep laughing. I'm an, I told you I'm an affirmation addict. Man. You don't see all the stuff underneath here because I'm clothed. That's exactly, if I can possibly make a spiritual point, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. It clothes us with power. So the weakest, strongest, string bean, anti-Arnold Schwarzenegger in the world. When he receives the Holy Ghost, he is clothed with power. And Jesus said, look, I know you guys have seen a lot. I know you've done a lot. I know you've been through a lot. I know you believe like nobody believes, but I'm telling you right now, you don't want to go out into that big, mean world until you are endued with power from on high. You can preach and you can teach and you can do a lot of stuff on your own, but hear me, trust me, there are some big, mean monsters out there. There's some devils out there. There's some issues out there. You want to make sure you are clothed with power. Power. Amen. You know why? And I was so glad when Pastor Rick asked me to talk about this tonight because it, this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. I, 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 just, I just know myself, and I know that I'm not good enough just on my own. And I know that when I received the Holy Ghost, when I was baptized and filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, something changed in me. I went from weakling to strongling, if that's a word. I went from, from pretty weak and pretty little to be pretty strong. I was bold in the Lord. There's a power to go out and change the world. Don't try to change the world without the Holy Ghost, folks. Don't try to go out there and fight the battle alone. He said, I'm going away, but I don't want you to go by yourself. Wait until it comes. Whew. Amen. And I'm just going to tell somebody today, I know there's so many doctrines about the Holy Spirit. Some of you, I can sense you checking me out right now. Where does he land on the Holy Spirit doctrine right now? I'm just going to tell you, I'm, no, I'm, I'm tired of being afraid of talking about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just tired of, of being timid when it comes to this subject. We need to understand what happened to us. It's amazing how we, with this amazing testimony and this amazing strength, become silent little Christians when, when somebody from the outside comes in. We don't want to talk about the Holy Ghost. That's just too weird. In fact, a lot of people won't even say ghost. They say spirit because they're afraid ghost sends the wrong signal. Okay, wow, that went over like a lead balloon. You ain't laughing anymore. <sighs> Amen. I I'm going to tell you that the greatest message <laughs> that Jesus gave to his church, to his original 12, was the message that you don't have to go alone. I'm going to baptize you with 
power. Now, I'm not talking about the power of the cross, folks. We know that the cross saves us. We know the cross is enough. We know when we empower Jesus Christ, uh, uh, he just makes us something new. Uh, We know that the cross is what forgives us and saves us. We don't need anything more than the cross uh, to be who we are. Call it a second work of grace. Call it whatever label you want to put on it. All I know is, is after my salvation, there is also an experience uh, called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes in my life and it empowers me and it strengthens me and it builds me up and I go into the world boldly as no previous man like myself could go before because he is with me. Thank you. Amen. I just... I just feel that, that, that in this generation, in this hour, where it's, it's harder, it seems, than it's ever been. It's more difficult. It's, we fight battles, and we're fighting secularism, which may be the greatest enemy of the church right now. Is secular. We're fighting all kinds of crazy things, and yet in this world that is so astute and so educated and so carefully put together and so secular in mindset, yet spiritualism is at an all-time high high. You see, the world doesn't want to be religious, but they do want to be spiritual. There's a whole nation over there in China that may take over the world, and they're very spiritual. They don't know Jesus, but they are very spiritual in their approach. We've got a whole undercurrent, a whole movement in this hour, in this country, and call it yoga. I'm not going to preach anti-yoga. I'm going to talk about just meditation. Everybody wants to get into a spiritual mindset. Everybody wants to be self-actualized, and the key to self-actualization is to find somehow, connect with the inner spirit man, and no one's sure what's out there, but they all all think that there must be, there's something, some kind of spirit realm that we can connect with. You can talk to the greatest atheists on the planet and even they will let a little crack come through the door to possibly maybe admit that there's some kind of spiritual thing that's happening on the earth. I just want to say to you right now, the mystery has been revealed when Jesus Christ said, yes, there is a spirit He's called the Holy Spirit, and if you'll let him empower you and fill you, you will be different. Amen. Wow. So they all got together, 10 days of waiting. They were in one mind and one accord in Acts chapter 2, and you know the story. A lot of you do. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, one mind, one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared in them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them my trance. You know that story. Now, my job tonight is not to, to I'm, I'm just not going to break all that down and try to get you to figure all this out. But here's, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, read Acts chapter 8. And in Acts chapter 8, the scripture says that Philip was at Samaria and they were having revival, folks. <laughs> Healings, miracles, signs, wonders. You talk about revival. Man, if we'd had what's happening in Samaria happening here this weekend, we would all just be translated to, a, to another world. I'm telling you, it, it was unbelievable what was going on. And yet the church recognized, the church leaders recognized that while they had believed in Jesus, they had been baptized into Jesus Christ. They were seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. There was one thing that hadn't happened yet, and that is the Holy Spirit had not fallen just yet. And so they sent to them Peter and John. And when Peter and John were come to Samaria, they looked at all these brand new baby Christians who were baptized in the, into Jesus Christ and who were serving the Lord and believing and denouncing their past and embracing their future. And they looked at them and they said, but Jesus told us to hurry up and wait to be empowered to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. And Peter and John laid their hands on them. And while the scripture doesn't specifically say what happened, something happened because the most noted spiritualist in the whole community said, hey, here's my wallet. I want to know, I want to pay you guys to figure out, can you guys tell me how to do that trick? 
right? Read chapter 8 of Acts. And so we don't know what happened, but something happened that was visible, that changed him. Something was manifest. That which was within manifest itself without. And all of them walked away knowing, yes, I remember when I was baptized. I remember when I got saved, but I also remember when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, you know the story. We could go on and on and on. Cornelius, he was just... Cornelius was a great man. Cornelius gave his alms, blah, 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 blah. But Peter went to Cornelius because he wasn't quite there. And as he spake the word of God, he told him about Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost fell on them and he spake with tongues and he prophesied. And they said, whoa, dude, the same thing that happened to us in Jerusalem is now happening to the Gentiles. Mind blown. Acts chapter 19, Paul walks into the upper coast of Ephesus. You know the story well. He sees some believers. We don't know the full extent of their belief, but apparently they believed in the Messiah. He talked to them about Jesus Christ. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And then an evidence, a manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit fell on them. They spake with tongues and they prophesied. I'm not going to tell you. Now, if I'm wrong, if Pastor Rick, I don't know the full extent of the teaching, but uh, I, I am one that, that says, I'm not going to say you have to speak with tongues every single time to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I think it's the most common manifestation in the scriptures when people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes that was the result. And when I received the Holy Spirit, that's what happened to me. All I'm going to tell you is this, is that if you want the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ said, ask your heavenly father. And he wants to give good gifts to his children. If, if earthly men give good gifts to their kids, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? My one word to word and worship before I shut up and sit down and let happen whatever needs to happen is this. Don't go out and try to start Campus 4. Don't go out and try to, try to blow up Pittsburgh. Don't do it unless you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I know enough about Pastor Rick to know that he's not ashamed of it. He's not afraid to preach it. He wants a spirit-led, spirit-empowered, spirit-fired church. And I think I'm looking at a group of people that want to be filled up with the Holy Spirit today, tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Let us be filled with that which God has for us. I'm sorry I took so long. Musicians, if you'll come, I don't know how we're going to wrap all this up, but I just believe in.